comes after the end of history. Back in 1989, when the Berlin Wall had fallen and the end of the Soviet Union was near, U.S. political scientist Francis Fukuyama argued that the success of Western liberal democracy suggested that humanity had arrived at the close of a great ideological struggle. But nearly 30 years later, democracy is under assault across the globe, with the rise of authoritarian, illiberal and nationalist governments. In his new book, Identity, the Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment, Francis Fukuyama criticizes what he says is a traditional left-right spectrum of politics giving way to one defined by identity. Francis Fukuyama, thanks for joining me on Upfront. In your new book, Identity, you argue that so-called identity politics is one of the chief threats to liberal democracies today. How do you define identity politics, and how is what you're saying any different to what conservatives have been complaining about for years? Well, identity is based on this feeling that I have this inner um, self that's not being adequately recognized, and what I want more than resources or stuff is actually recognition and respect. Uh, and that's what drives uh, uh, groups to enter into politics, because they feel as members of groups, particularly if they've been marginalized, that they're not getting respect, and they want that from the political system. And liberal democracy is based on individuals, not on group memberships, and not on, you know, these yeah, there's some very thoughtful parts of the book, and then there's bits where you make some sweeping statements. You say Black Lives Matter is fighting for equality and basic rights. Mm -hmm. ISIL, mm -hmm. an extremist group, terrorist group, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, has a very genocidal approach to the mm -hmm. rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't fighting for equality and justice, clearly. But then you seem to lump them together in this critique mm -hmm. of identity politics. You literally put them together on the same page. Yeah. Well, morally, obviously, they're not equivalent at all. Uh, I think what's the same is actually the psychology, because if you look at the psychology of many people that sign up for ISIS, they believe that Muslims around the world are being disrespected, killed, you yeah. know, disregarded, uh, and that they need agency, and that their membership in this group is what's going to give them uh, both community, uh, you know, fellowship with other Muslims. They're going to mm. be able to support that group. Uh, now, of course, the way they do it is, is you know, is terrible. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know... But to, to say that ISIL and Black Lives Matter are different manifestations of the same phenomenon is a little bit too far, they're, isn't it? They're manifestations of a similar psychological phenomenon. The only way I'm saying that these groups are comparable is in that psychological phenomenon whereby you know, that demand for dignity is very deeply rooted in all of us. It may be more justified in some cases than in others, but there is a common, you know, framework in which we, uh, this happens. One of the other uh, important arguments that you raise in the book is about class. Mm -hmm. You talk about the importance of challenging inequality. Um, many would say that there's an intersectional politics. Mm -hmm. They talk about race and class. You can't treat these things on their own, mm -hmm. and sometimes solving one problem doesn't solve the other. For example, if we say, actually, we should focus on class, not identity issues, race mm -hmm. issues. How do you deal with a recent study which found that black boys raised in the U.S., even in the wealthiest families, mm -hmm. living in the nicest neighborhoods, are still less likely to earn in adulthood what white boys with similar backgrounds might earn? They're more likely to become poor than to stay wealthy. Now, in that scenario, mm -hmm. dealing with class and income is not enough. You have to deal with the yeah, racism but and I the discrimination that they're enduring. Yeah. No, so everybody is subject to that kind of discrimination, but I think there's also a ton of empirical data out there that actually shows that class defined by your level of education, basically whether you've got a higher education or just a high school education or less, is really the th single thing that's the most determinative of your life opportunities and you outcomes. You say that, and yet, and as that, I say, and this... It, and it cuts across uh, ethnic, It doesn't always racial. cut across. So you say that the study I'm citing for the, uh, from the Equality of Opportunity mm -hmm. Project, a group of researchers at your mm -hmm. college, Stanford, Harvard, mm -hmm. and the Census Bureau, they found that black men raised in the top 1% by millionaires mm -hmm. were as likely to be incarcerated as white men raised in households earning $36,000 a year. Mm -hmm. You can't say that class is, is, is well, some kind of level yeah, up. I mean, there's plenty of data showing that education uh, is really what's important in determining uh, outcomes. Now, access to education is one of the big disadvantages that black people in the United States have, and so that's, you know, that is something that is determined by race. But I do think that, you know, if you look at the overall phenomenon of inequality in the United States, a lot of that is in the white population, because the white population has gone in these two opposite directions as well. Well-educated white people have done extremely well. Poorly educated white people have fallen off a social cliff in many respects. So I want to push back on your education point because it does feel a little bit utopian. Mm -hmm. If you take France, which you also talk about in the mm -hmm. book, you say, for example, if the French liberalize their labor laws, that will help minority communities who feel marginalized, left out of the economy. And yet 
all of the surveys show that, for example, in France, if your name is Mohammed, mm -hmm. you're four times less likely to be invited back for a job interview, even with the same CV, same mm -hmm. resume, mm -hmm. as your Christian, white, Catholic counterpart. Mm -hmm. Education doesn't solve that problem. That's a it race doesn't. issue. It that doesn't. requires, quote unquote, identity yeah. politics. Yeah. I say that, you know, all of these specific forms of discrimination are bad. Uh, there's a perfectly good reason for uh, pushing back against these specific forms of discrimination. But I also think that you need to balance that with a sense of citizenship uh, and a sense of broader political community if you're going to sustain a democracy. Do you not agree that the real threat from identity politics in the United States to Western societies as a whole comes not from the left's supposed obsession mm -hmm. with ethnic minorities or transgender rights, but from a president of the United States who has enabled yeah, and stoked course. white well, nationalism, <laughs> neo-Nazism? That's why I wrote the book. I mean, you know, well, you that's say why that's why I wrote the book, but there's a lot of... It feels like you're trying to bend I'm over trying, backwards no, to do this kind of... No, the I'm, right's bad, but the I'm, left's no, bad. I'm but trying the to, right is no, a neo-Nazi right now. I'm trying to explain, you know, the right of the right, and I think that there is a kind of tone deafness uh, by, you know, from people on the left to actually what bothers people and what has made a lot of people vote for these populist candidates, not just in the United States, but in Europe as well. Some of it is just racism, mm. xenophobia, and so forth, but a lot of it is, you know, driven by other things that elites really have not paid a lot of attention to a, you know, fairly broad swath of uh, America that constitutes, you know, when you think about the, you know, the 99 percent, uh, a lot of those people are in there. And I think that if you don't figure out what is bothering them, uh, you're not going to solve the underlying problem that is driving the polarization in the United States. But I'm asking you, would you accept, is it an equal, is it, it's, it's asymmetric polarization, yeah, do you, it's do you accept? It's that asymmetric, it? yeah, so I think the social justice issues are largely, you know, uh, held by the, the, the uh, you know, the left-wing groups, but I do think that there's also a legitimate issue, things on the right, le legitimate uh, in addition the to the right. racism and bigotry. Just talk about yourself, uh, what about you, how would you define mm -hmm. your own identity? You're the grandson of Japanese immigrants mm -hmm. to the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, whenever I'm asked that, uh, and this was true ever since I was a child, I'd say I'm, uh, I'm an American. I mean, I never thought of myself as an Asian American or a Japanese American, and I always thought, you know, mm. part of the reason that it's great to be in America is that I don't have to think that way. When you see, for example, Asian Americans mm -hmm. wanting to assert a group identity, uh, wanting to be better represented in public life or mm -hmm. popular culture, you have the recent hit movie, Crazy Rich Asians, which has topped the box office, the first all-Asian uh, cast. That's been celebrated by a great mm -hmm. deal of Asian Americans. Is it, is it wrong to celebrate that? Black Americans who look at Black Panther and say, finally, a movie with a black cast, a black director. Isn't that something to celebrate, or is that something you think is dangerous or wrong? I don't think it's dangerous or wrong. I mean, I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't particularly celebrate it, but... but uh, you don't care that well, if, you know, it more people who look like you should it, be it, on film? It, it represents something. It, it's not really a, a, a movie about America. You know, it's about a lot of rich Chinese in Singapore. Mm. You know, I mean, they're connected to America, but... You know, it, it's a phenomenon about the rise of Well, Black of Panther China. is about a fictional country. It's not about the storyline. It's yeah. about who you see on screen, the writers, mm -hmm. the director, the actors, yeah. who you have as role models. You don't think that's important to, you know, in this age of identity? No? I think I've had a pretty interesting, successful life, and it never depended on me seeing a lot of Asian role models out there. Uh, I, you know, never thought that that was important in shaping my own career or whatever I did, I thought that... Do you uh, recognize you're pro probably quite distinctive and a minority on that? Most people do well, want some kind of role models. Yeah. I mean, and also Asians are different from African Americans and they're different from, you know, other it's women. That, yeah, and they're different which is the whole point, which is, why, which is why they well, want no, to but, see... No, but I'm just saying Why everyone wants but, to get yeah, a bit but, of representation. Well, yeah, but I'm... You know, I just think that representation by itself uh, oftentimes conflicts with other kinds of social values that are important. Like right now, there's this big fight going on in the New York public school system about who gets access to these elite uh, public high schools. Mm. Uh, and in that case, uh, representation, you know, the representation argument acts directly against the interests of Asian Americans because they're way overrepresented in, in those schools because they do better on tests and so forth. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of competing goods here. And if your single focus is on representation, uh, it's, you know, it's going to conflict with some of those other values. And 
you're most famous for your essay in the phrase, the end of history, mm -hmm. uh, what you called, quote, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. Do you have any regrets about that line, about that thesis, looking back now? Well, no. You know, I wrote that in the middle of what's called the third wave of democratization, where the world went from having about 35 democracies yeah, sure. to over 100 democracies. Yeah. So there is a lot of movement in that uh, direction. Over the last 10 years, we've been moving in the opposite direction, not dramatically, but you know, in important ways, the rise of populism, rise of China, uh, and so forth. And so obviously, it's a different era. You know, we're not converging like we seem to be in the 1990s on, on liberal democracy. But you know, in the long run, uh, how durable that counter trend is, it's, it's really not clear. Uh, I think that democracy still has a lot of support around the world, and you see this, you know, constantly showing up in funny places like Armenia or Malaysia so you're, or... You're fundamentally you know. an optimist about the future? Well, you know, I, I just think that you need a balanced view. I think that people tend to get carried away by current events, and right now there's, I think, a little bit of excessive pessimism about global democracy, because I think democracy has more going for it than, you know, a lot of people would uh, recognize right now. Francis Fukuyama, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks for joining me on Upfront. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.